My name is Andrei Golovachev, uh, and uh, you know, obviously, due to the pandemic, uh, I haven't had a chance to practice English. So you will have to tolerate my my rust in English for tonight. Uh, as Kathy has already said, um, I'm an aspiring uh, mountain guide from Russia, and I'm an adventure photographer. I undergo my um, IFMJ guide certification in Kyrgyzstan. And uh, it just so happened that uh, I lived uh, in the UK uh, for about four years during my office career. And uh, I'm still a member of uh, the Alpine Club UK. And uh, a few years ago, I organized uh, a winter climbing meet for them. And uh, I was uh, about to organize another climbing meet for them uh, this winter in North Ossetia. But unfortunately, I had to cancel it because of COVID, obviously. And uh, as some of you already know, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I organized uh, Eagle Club uh, meet in Siberia as well. Um, originally, I am from um, St. Petersburg. Uh, which is in the European part of Russia, uh, but currently I'm based in uh, Siberia, in Shiragesh, for, for the season. And that mostly explains my sleepiness. It's like three o'clock in the morning right now. But anyways, uh, I've had some coffee. <laughs> uh, anyway, I invite you on a journey through major skiing destinations of Russia. There are total eight. Uh, I've chosen eight, certainly there are more. And uh, I will share some insider tips and uh, my talk hopefully will inspire a trip, whether it is uh, for skiing groomers, side country skiing, ski tour, or perhaps an expedition. After all, as you will see, Russia is a very varied skiing destination, in my opinion, worth visiting many times. To make it a little bit more personal, we will be uh, on this journey with a typical Russian ski bum who starts his season early in November and uh, follows fresh snow through most of the 11 time zones of Russia until May. Now I'm going to share my screen now uh, and uh, I encourage to view my slides full screen as uh, photos uh, I'm going to share are probably more interesting than my talking head. But before we start, um, I want to break some negative stereotypes that uh, you might have about Russia. And the first one is that uh, Russia is far away and uh, because of that, it's uh, like once in a lifetime destination. Uh, before pandemic, uh, there were low cost flights from Luton to Moscow, like four hours nonstop. And uh, it used to cost uh, as low as uh, 50 pounds return. And uh, a convenient connection in Moscow uh, meant that you could leave your job uh, on Friday evening and uh, be skiing in Siberia on Saturday afternoon. So it's not really that far away. Uh, expensive and uh, complicated logistics, probably, uh, but uh, for some reason, almost every foreigner is uh, obsessed with uh, Russian trains and with uh, Trans-Siberian um, Trans-Siberian trains. I have no idea why we have plenty of uh, uh, reasonably priced uh, domestic flights. And uh, to give you an idea, I have uh, put some domestic flight costs here. For example, uh, 250 pounds uh, would be a, an average flight to Kamchatka. Return, all, all prices are return. And uh, to go to Siberia, you will have to pay like 120 till 
200 pounds return and only 60 pounds return uh, from Moscow to Caucasus. I've given uh, lift costs per day in euros and uh, the most expensive is uh, about 40 euros per day with a median of 25 euros per day. So you can see it's uh, somewhat cheaper than in Europe on average. Um, visas and permits, uh, that's certainly an impediment still, but uh, since 1st of January, Russia has introduced uh, electronic visas with uh, uh, most, for most European citizens, uh, except unfortunately Great Britain and the United States, but hopefully that will change soon. Still getting an ordinary visa is uh, not such a big deal uh, as long as you have an invitation, just have to visit uh, the consulate in person and then your visa will be ready in 10 working days. Uh, gloomy people who never smile. Mm. <laughs> As you probably see, that's not true. Uh, but uh, what I can say for sure is that uh, Russian smile is never tried. Uh, as long as uh, you see a Russian person smiling, you can be sure that uh, he or she is uh, very sincere. So we don't smile that often indeed, but <laughs> Foreigners are always welcome, regardless of uh, what happens in uh, politics. Now, some positive things. And by the way, that's our hypothetical ski bum on the left. Well, uh, positive things, uh, very varied climate and uh, snow types. Uh, for you, that may be difficult to realize, but uh, the country is big and uh, the climates are very different and because of that the snow types are also very different. Uh, you can get continental dry champagne powder in Siberia and uh, maritime dense powder in uh, Sochi. The season is long, uh, as I've said, uh, between probably early November or even late October. Up until uh, early June, probably. Um, the whole country is relatively uh, uncrowded. Uh, and uh, as I was typing this, uh, I thought about my uh, ski trip to uh, Norway, uh, to Lungen Alps, uh, where I had a chance to do some ski touring. Admittedly, it was uh, ski touring by guidebook, but I remember very well that uh, many slopes uh, that we skied, they were completely skied out to moguls. And uh, I assure that in Russia, it's very, it would be a very rare situation. There is not so much competition for fresh snow, especially on a ski tour. Um, Finally, in my view, infrastructure and service is probably better than you think. But, uh, well, having traveled to uh, 40 countries myself, uh, I have grounds to believe that uh, Russia is uh, one of the most underrated uh, travel destinations. Uh, moving on, uh, on this, uh, presentation, uh, most of the photos uh, have been taken by myself unless uh, specified otherwise. And uh, I will leave some time for questions at the end of the presentation. So let's, let's move on uh, to Western Siberia without any further ado. Together with our Ski bum who starts his skiing season in early November. You can see the map of Russia and uh, locations in Western Siberia, in particular, uh, Shergesh Ski Resort, 
where I am currently situated. It takes uh, four and a half hours of the night flight from Moscow and then about uh, three hours drive from the airport to the ski resort. That's a typical picture of uh, earlier in the season. You can see that line forms well before the dawn. And uh, in early November, Sherigash Resort is uh, the cozy and uh, metaphorically speaking warm place uh, where you can see free skin community of the whole country, including some professional FWT athletes all eager to open their season. So on a powder day, you can see lines in the darkness. Uh, some quick summary. And by the way, on the left, you see a picture very typical for Sheregesh Resort, those rolling hills in the morning mist. There is no red tape, which means uh, no permits, uh, no restrictions in this area. The top point is uh, 1500 meters and uh, the elevation drop is about 600 meters. The season lasts between mid-November and uh, March. The climate is uh, very cold yet dry and uh, I will come to that later. Uh, skiing is mostly side country tree skiing with some pillows. Also, apart from side country, there are some cats. There is some cat skiing and some day touring. And in essence, uh, Shiragesh is uh, free skiing sandbox, so to ski, uh, where beginner skiers can uh, get off piste in a relatively safe environment uh, as long as they manage to escape tree wells and uh, creeks hidden by the snow. Now, uh, Shergesh is a small mining town uh, which uh, became a ski resort in early 80s and became quite popular in uh, 2000. And uh, the picture on the left shows uh, one of the Shergesh streets with the slopes in the background. Uh, and on the right, on the top right, uh, you can see uh, how much snow we can get. That snow cornice is uh, on top of uh, a balcony on the very last floor. Uh, and it, uh, I can see it uh, from my window. Uh, and uh, if I remember correctly, it formed for like only a few weeks, then it collapsed. <laughs> so uh, quite a lot of snow. Uh, we have Bikini Skiing Fest in April, which gathers uh, thousands of participants on the slopes from the entire Siberia. That's uh, uh, Cherigesh. Uh, overview, the main mountain, and uh, to give you the idea of scale, uh, the slopes are about two kilometers long. Uh, there are several companies, uh, several competing chairlift operators, which keeps uh, prices quite low. Uh, there are also uh, reasonably priced cat skin operators. Uh, which uh, operate uh, far away from, from the resort on the northern side of the massive around here. Uh, so they don't interfere too much with side country skiing. Shetagesh has a, a unique microclimate and uh, you can see that as you travel uh, from the airport. Uh, the snowpack becomes uh, 
um, how to say, the amount of snow is increasing as you drive from the airport closer and closer to the destination. Uh, a typical uh, early season snowfall is presented on this picture. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was taken uh, in mid-December. So you can see how big the snowflakes are. And uh, usually it uh, dumps uh, once in five to 10 days or so. So by the end of the season, we have uh, quite, quite considerable snowpack. Now that's uh, what we call champagne powder. Uh, thanks to cold temperatures, the snow remains uh, fluffy for weeks and uh, ski tracks are not too much of an issue. In particular, uh, on this photo, uh, we skied uh, maybe four days after the last uh, snowfall and you can see the snow is still very fluffy. That's uh, the view you can get uh, on a sunset from the top of the mountain. Again, with those rolling hills and uh, you can see the uh, iron ore mine here in the town, down in the valley. And uh, as I've already mentioned, the climate is cold. Uh, this winter we had temperatures as low as uh, minus 35. But uh, believe me, if you dress well, um, it's not such a big problem. You only have two problems really uh, at such low temperatures. First is that your skis don't, don't really glide. And uh, second is your climbing skin doesn't stick. <laughs> so forget about uh, vacuum skins if you are coming to Siberia, you need to proper glue skin, like black diamond, for example. Uh, because of such uh, cold, uh, some meteorological phenomena like uh, diamond dust in the air uh, and uh, halo are very common. But again, uh, because the air is uh, very dry, in fact, it's uh, easier to tolerate the cold uh, than you think. But still, Gore-Tex jackets are frowned upon by the locals who prefer down jackets. Uh, what else? Uh, the rocks you can see in the foreground, uh, they are bolted and uh, they are frequented by Siberian climbers in summer. A few more photos. Um, to reach untracked snow, you can uh, ski tour or use snow cuts or snowmobiles. Sometimes we even have to walk a little bit. This photo was taken on a sunset and you can see uh, chairlifts in the background, but in fact, we had to ski tour for quite a while. This is a, a forest uh, near chairlifts, one of the most accessible spots. So plenty of tree scheme. And that's uh, a stone run, rather gentle, uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, jumping up those stones is a big fun. But uh, at some point later in the season, later in the season, uh, the terrain uh, becomes more or less flat <laughs> because all those stones they just disappear <laughs> under the snow. And uh, funny enough, uh, in the beginning of the season there are some uh, bushes, obviously, which get covered by the snow, 
but later in the season, maybe in uh, early March, a, a second <laughs> layer of bushes grows, which in fact uh, are trees, <laughs> which are now covered by the snow that they look like bushes <laughs> and impede your skin. But uh, that's all about side country. If you are more into uh, ski touring, you have more destinations, like shown on this photo. It's a, a steam house, it's a steam sauna, sorry, uh, by, a by a river, very close to Sherigesh. Uh, it just takes two hours by train to reach this wilderness. And uh, there are dozens of cabins scattered in taiga forests. And those cabins are unguarded. You have to book them in advance. In theory, uh, hut to hut touring is possible, but uh, you'd have to put food stashes somehow. Again, cause uh, cabins are unguarded. It's not the case uh, like you have in the Alps where you can just come and uh, have a glass of wine. No, unfortunately, not yet. Uh, summary about uh, Lushba area. That's where I took the Eagle Club two years ago. There is no red tape, uh, no restrictions. Uh, the drop is, the vertical drop is between 300 to 600 meters. The season is, it ends a little bit earlier than in uh, Sherigesh because the slope angles are steeper. And uh, because of that, there may be wet avalanches in March already in Lushba. So it's a good idea to finish your touring by the end of Feb February. Same climate, obviously, because it's very close to Sherigesh. Uh, cabin based day touring and uh, many, many more pillow lines and some subalpine areas as well. In essence, I, I'd say that's a digital detox uh, because uh, there is no cellular mobile connection in that area. So you can uh, enjoy <laughs> the freedom of living without social networks and internet and uh, generally enjoy the quietness of uh, winter taiga forest. This place is only accessible by train. Uh, like uh, Koror station you have in Scotland. Uh, there are no roads that lead to Lushba only, only by train. Uh, there is no first class on that train and uh, skiers uh, have to disembark the train uh, in two minutes. <laughs> That's the stop time, but obviously the train driver will wait. But anyway. Same steam sauna by the daylight. Um, and on the top right photo, you see the interior uh, of a typical cabin. On the inside, you see that the snow covers uh, almost half of the window. And this photo was taken in, uh, in early December. And by early January, I was told that uh, mice dig tunnels in the snow and you can observe mice <laughs> behind the glass living their own life. <laughs> so you can imagine how funny it can be. Uh, in the bottom right, uh, you can see uh, people, skiers, uh, crossing, crossing the river uh, using uh, an inflatable catamaran. And uh, apparently, uh, if the river freezes, you obviously can cross using a snowmobile if it doesn't freeze you across in a catamaran, but uh, there is a few days ago, uh, there is a condition, uh, there is a time when uh, 
there's floating ice in the river and uh, it's very difficult to cross even on a catamaran. Anyway, it's quite an adventure <laughs> at minus 20. While living in a, in a cabin, uh, you have to fetch water from, from a river or well. But again, as I've said, uh, the whole point of such a trip is to enjoy the quietness and uh, it is not uncommon to hear snow falling. Be very quiet. That's a typical view you would get from a cabin in a sunset. Terrain of the Lushba area. You see there are many hills in the foreground, uh, somewhere in between 700 meters uh, up to 1000 meters. But uh, in the background, you see some subalpine area. And there are um, a few cabins in that area as well. But uh, most of the steeper stuff is uh, located closer to the river. There are slopes uh, uh, between 20 and uh, 35 to 40 degrees. If you look up, you may see birch trees covered with uh, frost on a sunny day. That's a group going up on white taiga forest. Ready to go down. You can see by the level of uh, trees that the slope is uh, rather steep, this particular one. And uh, terrain can be playful. Now that's what we call it, uh, over powder. When there's too much snow, <laughs> it can be annoying even if you have fat skis, if uh, there is not enough angle. Now, um, that's it about West Siberia. And uh, in uh, late November, late December, our a typical skier, our ski bomb, is uh, ready to take a train to our next destination, Mamai. Bottomless powder by the world's deepest lake. You can see uh, the lake in the background. And as you probably know, Baikal is the uh, world's deepest lake. It's about one and a half kilometers deep. And uh, Mamai is a valley, which uh, once was a secret spot, uh, but now it has become a rather mainstream mecca of uh, free skiers, thanks to it, uh, unique microclimate, all the humidity that comes from the lake, it uh, uh, ends up um, as a precipitation and uh, the valley is shielded from uh, strong winds. And because of that, uh, the snow is uh, deep, frequent and uh, rather stable in terms of avalanches. Uh, the valley is only 12 kilometers away from the, from the lake. And uh, a good thing about this spot is uh, that uh, there is no cat skiing and uh, no heli skiing. It's all banned in this area, so it's uh, only for ski tourers. You can see on the map, it's a little bit uh, more far away than Western Siberia. 
It takes uh, six hours of a night flight from Moscow, then uh, from Moscow to Irkutsk, and then you drive around uh, 200 kilometers, or you take a train around Baikal to its uh, southern shores, and then you have uh, to go about 10 kilometers on skis while your luggage is uh, brought is being brought to the cabin uh, by snowmobile. You can see it, that's a rather typical condition of snow uh, in Mamai. Uh, the season is uh, interesting. The season is between uh, mid-November up until uh, mid-January until uh, Baikal freezes. So when the lake freezes, uh, the precipitation coming from the lake, it stops and no more powder. And uh, temperatures drop considerably. So in February, it's uh, much colder. The climate is uh, not so uh, mild as in December uh, or January. Uh, Skiing is also possible uh, in March, but uh, mostly for locals because everyone else is uh, somewhere else in March. Humidity from the lake uh, creates uh, between four to six meters of uh, snow during the season. And uh, you can expect uh, one or two dumps per week of uh, half a meter of fresh snow which is uh, deep, light, and dry. And uh, same as in Western Siberia, it does not degrade for days. So crossing someone else's tracks is not such a big deal. Uh, there are no restrictions. Um, the elevations and drops are very similar to those uh, of Sheregesh. I've already uh, described the climate. Skiing is cabin-based day touring, uh, but uh, the terrain is a little bit different. Uh, well, it's quite different <laughs> actually, because uh, skiing mostly occurs in a subalpine zone. Uh, there are not so many trees as you get in Western Siberia, which, for some people makes uh, skiing more pleasant, arguably for those who <laughs> don't like tight tree skiing. And uh, I would say that uh, slope angles are more serious uh, as you will see on the following slide. And uh, the place also is also known uh, for its uh, free skiing community, uh, very tightly knit community. Mm, every evening people uh, gather in cabins and uh, discuss the day and uh, everyone is uh, cheerful, friendly, and uh, people also exchange uh, their opinion uh, on the radio during the day. So it's, it's funny. That's the valley on fat map. Uh, you can see that slope angles are considerable between uh, 25 and up to 40 and even more. But still, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, thanks to uh, lack of strong winds, uh, there are not so many avalanches luckily. And the terrain is uh, very, very different, uh, very varied. There are many hanging valleys, cirques, uh, couloirs, and various subalpine terrain. That's how it looks like in reality. So you see rare trees, steep angles, deep snow. can see the tracks here.
again like in western siberia in mamai uh, you stay in warm cabins which you obviously have to book in advance and uh, i've already mentioned these days mamai is uh, rather overcrowded so you have to book one year in advance that's a typical view from a ridge and you can see Lake Baikal on the horizon. That's it about Mamai. And our next stop is Sochi, where our ski bum flies via Moscow. Now, I spent uh, my previous season, my last year, uh, I spent uh, three months in uh, Sochi and I don't have a single photo from, from it. Can you guess why? Because I skied, right? <laughs> um, so if I was to describe Sochi in a few words, uh, it's a powder paradise with a uh, challenge in terrain uh, in an hour's drive from the sea. And uh, in my view, a season spent in uh, Sochi can considerably improve your skiing ability. So Sochi, uh, uh, just don't get confused, Sochi is uh, the name of the nearest big city and Krasnaya Poliana is uh, the skiing area itself. It might be difficult for you to pronounce. Krasnaya Poliana. <sighs> now, that's not a joke. <laughs> this sign says, attention, fresh snow. This photo was taken uh, in April and this sign uh, gives a warning to pissed skiers on narrow skis so they don't run into <laughs> deposits of fresh snow that uh, hasn't been groomed yet. As for the logistics, uh, getting to Sochi uh, takes just two and a half hours from Moscow and then one hour drive, which as you can guess, it means that uh, skiers from Moscow rush in as they see a proper cyclone in the forecast. So the competition uh, for untracked snow is very fierce in Krasna Poliana. There are many weekend weathers. I've decided to give a bigger map here and you can see our destinations uh, in the Caucasus, we are now talking about Sochi, Krasnaya Poliana. Sochi is this city and uh, the resort itself is in the mountains here. That's the airport. And that's the Great Caucasus range. And on the left, there's the Black Sea. Krasnaya Poliana uh, has subtropical maritime climate due to southerly latitudes and uh, the proximity of the Black Sea. And in fact, uh, Sochi is the warmest city to host Winter Olympic Games. Back in uh, 2014, it happened. The snow is fluffy like in uh, Siberia, but without Siberian colds. Due to high humidity, uh, snowflakes, uh, sometimes they appear to be dish sized and I'm not exaggerating much. And uh, there are no fierce winds like in uh, some other destinations like Elbrus or Hibine. And uh, in a couple of hours, it can dump up to 50 centimeters or more than a meter overnight. So skiing through bow waves of uh, fresh snow is uh, rather common. 
you can see the picture of the resort after fresh snowfall. Now the catch, the catch is that uh, in subtropical climate, the snow does not remain fluffy for long, just a couple of days maximum, uh, and uh, it becomes very dense afterwards, just in a couple of days. And uh, also because it is warm, precipitation may come uh, in the form of rain, put in your Gore-Tex jacket to, to, to test. Sometimes uh, I'd say that uh, a cheap plastic poncho mocks an expensive Gore-Tex jacket. Also uh, due to the resort's popularity, uh, most obvious places get skied out very fast. As you can see on this photo, the dense net of ski tracks. <laughs> Obviously this, uh, this girl is probably very unhappy with what she's seen. <laughs> very tricky to find a fresh line, untracked line. It gets skied out literally in hours after ski lifts are open. Probably same as, as in Europe. That's uh, the ridge and uh, in the background there is Black Sea and this ridge it uh, blocks humid air masses coming from the sea and precipitation occurs. There are four uh, ski resorts uh, with quality infrastructure built for uh, 2014 Olympic Games and uh, all four resorts have different terrain, uh, different distance from the sea uh, and different microclimate and different avalanche conditions. So you can pick and choose depending on the day. And uh, for example, last season, uh, I had a seasonal ski pass and uh, I had the luxury of uh, making the decision in the morning where I, I would go to based on uh, various announcements, uh, which ski lifts are going to be closed due to avalanche conditions or, you know, just making guesses what would be best for the day. Right. Um, that's uh, the bird's eye view of one of the resorts, just one of the resorts. And you can see that uh, there is plenty of playground in between uh, pistes. And uh, you are only seeing the northern side. There is also southern slopes, in the reverse, which I'm going to show you now. You can see that southern slopes are mm, more gentle, but uh, there are also certain hazards like creeks covered by snow down below and so on. Summary. Uh, there is some, some red tape. Uh, Off-piste skiing is uh, half legal within resorts. As it often happens in Russia, you know, we have uh, rather strict laws, but uh, they are not always enforced. So same situation here. Uh, free skiing is technically banned, but uh, everyone does it. Sometimes uh, Zillow's ski patrol, uh, they uh, attempt to find you and block your ski pass. That, that happens sometimes. But anyway, uh, ski touring opportunities are unfortunately very limited. And the reason is uh, the vicinity of the uh, Caucasus Nature Reserve. So most of the lines, uh, most of the ski touring lines, they lie within uh, the Nature Reserve. And uh, uh, some day touring or even cabin-based touring is available, but only uh, 
with a guide from uh, uh, an authorized company who somehow managed to get permits from into the nature reserve. Also, uh, as you can probably guess, uh, border with uh, Georgia is nearby. So if you venture far enough, uh, you will be caught by border guards. So as I've said, uh, Krasna Apaliana is mostly about side country skiing and some ski touring. Like you can see on this photo, uh, there's uphill track and four downhill tracks here. Uh, the elevation drop is very considerable. It's uh, 1700 meters. And uh, as far as I know, the resort is uh, within the top 10 in the world by vertical drop. So quite considerable. The season is between mid-January and mid-March, uh, but you can have uh, powder days as late as in April. The climate is warm and wet. And the good thing about the resort is uh, that it's one of the few places in Russia where we do have uh, a proper avalanche forecast and uh, the slopes are um, avalanche controlled by uh, professionals who use Gazex exploders and uh, at times they even cut cornices uh, at night with an excavator. So that uh, with, uh, with the special type of snow, uh, which is uh, wet and sticks well, like every maritime snowpack, uh, makes it relatively safe to ski steep angles. And uh, again, the essence is, well, some people call it Sochifornia because that's the place where you can ski in the morning and then uh, surf in the sea in the afternoon. <laughs> sort of paradise <laughs> for an average person. The terrain, as you can see, it is rather complex with uh, numerous steep and narrow couloirs, cliffs and waterfalls. And as you see, the pistes, uh, they, they are not wide, they're narrow. And instead of going straight down, they zigzag, which is because the slopes are rather steep. Um, as I've said, all the obvious places get skied out uh, in a matter of hours. Uh, so to reach uh, untracked snow, people do some funny things <laughs> like shown in this photo. Uh, it's a good idea to have a guide uh, who can show you, uh, who can help you win with the competition uh, for the untracked snow. In this photo, you can see Gazex exploders in action. And uh, this chairlift is uh, not operating. And by the way, that's one of uh, ski touring spots. Uh, again, because this chairlift is defunct, it is common to uh, go like this to this call and ski down. Krasna Palana is also known for its uh, beautiful tree skiing. Uh, and uh, on a typical powder day, uh, the alpine zone would be off limits. Uh, the chairlifts uh, do not work because of uh, avalanche conditions. They only open next day, but during the powder day itself, you can ski in the woods, in magical beach forests which is steep, but not too dense. Uh, 
Also, Krasnaya Polyana is uh, about color skin, and uh, this is the entrance into one of the more mainstream colors. Sometimes they are narrow and uh, require good control, uh, and some colors may not be skiable, uh, depending on the amount of snow in the season. It's one of the less mainstream colors you from down below. And another example of color skin on a bluebird day. As I've said, uh, the main drawback is that uh, in a few days, uh, all that snow is becoming more and more dense. So, uh, Tracks uh, of other skiers are much more of an annoyance than uh, in Siberia. But uh, luckily in Krasnaya Polyana it snows very often, so it's not such a big issue. And uh, powder days can happen as late as April. But uh, nevertheless, uh, in late March, it's generally a good idea to move somewhere else, which we will do now. So our ski bomb travels to our next destination, Arhuz, for some spring ski touring. That's uh, the place uh, where I was uh, just a week ago uh, on a week long avalanche course and uh, then I stayed for one more week to do some ski touring with friends. And uh, why it says emergent ski touring destination uh, is because uh, the resort was uh, opened uh, in 2014, just six years ago. So it's a relatively new destination and uh, it gets promoted among free skiers and ski tourers. You can see that the terrain is uh, rather varied, from gentle on the left to steeper on the right. An example of how complicated logistics can be in Russia. So to get from Sochi to Arches, you would have to take a big detour of about 10 hours, because there is no road directly connecting to resorts, no road yet. But obviously, if you fly from Moscow, you fly into a different airport. And uh, the road takes like three hours drive from the airport. The only issue if you uh, venture from Krasnaya Polyana to Arches. Um, generally, Arches is higher than Krasnaya Polyana, but the climate is still mild uh, because uh, the range is protected by uh, the area is protected uh, by high mountains from northerly winds. And uh, from the standpoint of ski touring, uh, the elevation drop is about 1,000 meters. And uh, on a ski tour, you, on a day tour, uh, you uh, uh, ski at an altitude around 2,000 to 2,700 meters or so. But the highest point of the area is uh, 3,790 meters. The season is between February and mid-April. The climate is mild. And uh, unlike Krasnaya Polyana, it is uh, intermountain, which means uh, the avalanche danger is uh, more considerable. There can be weak layers in the snowpack and so on. Uh, skiing is mostly uh, day touring with uh, very limited side country.
that's the view of the whole area. You can see multiple valleys and uh, most of them are accessible on a day tour. You can see the elevations uh, some, somewhere between 2000 and 3000 and that's the resort and that's the village. So to get from the village to the resort, it takes about 20 minutes by car. A beautiful belt of uh, dolomite rocks on the southern slopes. Now, uh, the downside um, of the area is uh, that it has uh, become infested with uh, snow bikers. And, uh, you know, with the thrust to weight ratio of a modern jet fighter, uh, snow bikers then can uh, climb slopes of up to 40 degrees and uh, uh, they travel uh, to distant areas, but luckily uh, they seem to stick to certain areas like this mountain in the background and hopefully uh, the agreement between skiers and uh, snow bikers will be reached soon like to share the areas. To save time I'll just quickly flip through slides giving you the idea of how the area looks like. Plenty of fresh and dried snow. And uh, in Archis, there's one of the world's largest optical telescopes with a mirror of six meters in diameter something to visit on, uh, on your off day of skiing. Now from Archis, our skier uh, moves to Elbrus area where snow lasts for longer. With the altitude of uh, 56.42, Elbrus is uh, the highest mountain of the European continent. There are plenty of glaciers, which uh, often mandates uh, roped up travel. And uh, it also means uh, you'll have to acclimatize. And that fluted ridge in the background, by the way, is called Little Alaska. It hasn't been skied yet, as far as I know. To get to uh, the Elbrus area, it takes two and a half hours flight from Moscow, just a different airport, Mineralne uh, Vody here. Your base would be in uh, Terskol village, three hours drive from the airport. It's a nice village with uh, hotels, coniferous forests, and uh, the nearest big supermarket like 40 minutes away. Now, uh, there is a considerable uh, red tape in the Elbrus area. Uh, for many areas, you need border permits. Even the Russians need them. And uh, they have to be, they are free of charge, but they have to be applied for about a month in advance. Because the border is uh, very close, the border with Georgia. The vertical drop on certain uh, free skiing routes is up to 2700 meters, which is just like in Chamonix Val Blanche. The season is between mid April until May. Uh, if we are talking about uh, combining your ski touring with uh, the ascent of Mount Elbrus itself, uh, because earlier uh, it is too windy and uh, all the snow just gets blown away from the mountain. But if you choose to stick to lower elevations, uh, you can come as early as in February. And if you are 
mostly into glacier skiing, then you can stay up until late June. Uh, I've already mentioned that uh, the more away you get from the sea, the trickier avalanche climate you get. Uh, so here it is uh, into mountain. Uh, on certain years, there are problems with weak players. Uh, Now, uh, one of the highlights I've decided to include is uh, a skiing route uh, to Elbrus from the west. Now, before we go through it, I'll just quickly explain you what you see on this picture. We are looking, looking east, the mountain is on the left, and here is uh, Tierskol village itself, the lifts, on, on the southern side, Mount Chegat, where we will, where we have uh, some steep side country scheme. You also see Adilsu Valley and Adilsu. They are very popular destinations for um, cabin-based skiing, cabin-based ski touring. Now, uh, speaking about the uh, route up to Elbrus from the west, it's rather unconventional route. What makes it special is the vertical descent of 2700 meters. Uh, there are three camps. The first one is down in the valley, completely different area, uh, different approach. Uh, you would pitch your tent at uh, 2,700 meters elevation, and then you uh, go to this pass at 3,500, and your next camp would be at uh, 4,900 or so. And uh, you can choose to dig snow caves rather than uh, pitching a tent. It can be more convenient. The route starts in a pristine valley with some basics, uh, basic shepherd huts. You can stay at them. Here are the approaches, and on the left there is uh, the view from uh, our camp at uh, 3500, and that's the main summit of Elbrus. Our group. Now that's uh, the crux of the route. It's a narrow snow ridge at uh, about 4100 elevation, and uh, this ridge can be tricky on the way down because there are steep cliffs on the right. We don't want to fall there. As I've mentioned, there are plenty of glaciers around, um, which means roped travel. And this photo, uh, the skier descends one of the popular ski touring routes. And uh, avalanche conditions can be tricky. We remotely triggered this avalanche uh, just by standing at the bottom here in the flat area and it was a I suppose size two avalanche so it was a weak layer somewhere that two kilometer uh, two vertical kilometers wall of Donguzarun mountain, again very close to Terskol village, a good acclimatization tour. Obviously not up the face, but just to the foothills. This glacier is called figure seven, you can see why, and uh, it was uh, 
skied in late 90s. You can see a group of skiers down here. So as I've said, the elevation drop of this face is like two kilometers. Many steep lines, they require proper avalanche conditions to be skied, like this face on the left, for example. That's the sort of terrain you can ski off lifts on Mount Chagat. The top is 3,400 meters and the base is 2,200 or so, many couloirs, and that's the northern side. All <laughs> skied out. Now, if uh, the idea of uh, staying in snow caves doesn't excite you, you can choose to ski Elbrus uh, along uh, more conventional routes from the south or from the north, or you can traverse. And uh, the northern side is uh, much less crowded. It has better snow and uh, thus, in my view, it is more suitable for a, for a ski descent, but it uh, can be crevassed sometimes. And this night photo, you can see climbers on the north of Elbrus. Moving on to next destination, Hibine. You can extend your ski season considerably by um, skiing north of the Arctic Circle. And that's what uh, Hibine is about. They are tabletop mountains, much like you have in Scotland, but probably more snow. It takes about two hours flight from Moscow to get there, then one hour by car, or you can take uh, a train from St. Petersburg, uh, which takes about 20 hours, if you are more keen to combine skiing with uh, cultural sightseeing in St. Petersburg. Uh, Hibine, uh, on an old map, you can see the town in the bottom left, the airport, two areas with uh, ski lifts. And here is the town itself, in the south, and right in the middle of the massive, uh, there is a, a search and rescue base with uh, some cabins. that red area uh, are the boundaries of quarries and they extract uh, some mineral fertilizers here. And uh, the quarries keep on growing, but luckily there is a national park project, which hopefully will stop that soon. The vertical drop is about 500 meters. There is no red tape, uh, no restrictions. Uh, the season lasts from February uh, up until mid-April or maybe later. And uh, people do ski in January, but obviously uh, there is uh, not so much to see during the polar night, as you guess. Uh, the climate is Arctic, which um, in this case means it uh, can be quite windy which results in windblown cement, snow, there's some powder, nevertheless, and in spring people ski slush. The area has uh, one, the only proper avalanche bulletin in Russia, and there is some avalanche control of the slopes uh, which uh, face the city. This skiing is mostly about steep couloirs, sometimes with uh, rope access, but uh, there's also plenty of uh, wide and mellow snow fields. There's no cat skiing and no heli skiing to my knowledge. Russia's northernmost botanical garden is situated here. 
And if you are lucky, you can observe northern lights all the year round, provided it is dark. Obviously, uh, you know, you cannot see uh, northern lights in summer. Um, in uh, January, the sun only briefly shows up for an hour or so. And uh, in mid-April, the length of the day is about 15 hours, which uh, makes it possible to do uh, long tours. That's an old defunct uh, ski lifts, uh, and certainly there are more uh, modern ones. You can see the town right here down below and the tabletop mountains. As for skiing, um, like you see on this photo, uh, this rose snow is very typical of January when the sun is low above the horizon, very gentle colors. It is often windy and uh, wind slaps are the typical avalanche problem along with weak layers. And on this photo, you can see uh, core. One of the steep colors. Entrance to another one. Or as I've said, there are plenty of uh, more gentle slopes like this one. Uh, we are looking towards uh, the search and rescue base with cabins that I mentioned before. Right, so that's all about Hibini. And our next destination is my favorite one, Kamchatka. Since my first trip there uh, back in 2008, I, mm, during my first trip there back in 2008, I immediately fell in love with the place. And on this photo, you can see uh, Ruska Bay, uh, where we run our sail to ski trips, similar to what you can have in Norway. We sail here uh, from the city in about six hours, and then we just moor to a half sunken uh, ship and uh, just explore the slopes of the bay uh, for one week or so. Now, in Russian schools, the last desk used to be called Kamchatka. When looking at this map, you can see why. <laughs> it takes nine hours of a non-stop flight from Moscow to reach Kamchatka. The peninsula itself is uh, the size of Great Britain and it's uh, very remote. You get sunrise there before the Japanese do. There is uh, certainly a lack of infrastructure, but uh, it is compensated uh, by stunning nature. With uh, six areas on the peninsula protected as uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites, thanks to a unique combination of uh, volcanoes, glaciers, geysers, hot springs, and they all together form landscapes of stunning beauty and contrasts. You can see the airport here and our sail to ski bay marked with the red circle. And the black circle is uh, the highest volcano of the continent, Klyuchevskoy, and the main road goes for about 700 kilometers from the city up north. 
and uh, it's mostly unpaved. In Kamchatka, volcanoes are part of uh, people's daily lives and uh, looming above this village is uh, Klyuchevskoye volcano, which at uh, 4,800 meters is uh, the tallest active volcano in the Eurasia continent. You can see that small red spot at the top. And in fact, uh, the volcano is erupting right now as I speak. Same volcano on the left, and it's black because it's warm. The snow has all melted out. And there's the Russian bear in the foreground. I took this photo last summer and the bear was walking 40 meters uh, in front of our group. Rather common, but uh, so far in all cases, they run away as soon as they notice people. Just another view of a smoldering volcano, different one. Now the slope on the right, apparently skiable. It was skied once in the uh, mid nineties with uh, two vertical kilometers of vertical drop. But obviously it requires an expedition to go there. Summary of uh, skiing in Kamchatka, there is uh, some minimal uh, red tape, uh, mostly related to areas uh, where we keep our nuclear submarines and uh, those areas are off limits to foreigners. The base is zero at the level of the ocean and the vertical drop is around 700 to 800 meters and that applies to sail to ski itineraries. The season for sail to ski is between late April uh, until May. The climate is maritime. And you can do all sorts of skiing related uh, things in Kamchatka, ski touring, heli skiing, cat skiing, snowmobile supported skiing, just everything, except perhaps uh, for side country skiing because there are not so many good uh, ski resorts in Kamchatka. It's all too, too wild. That's the only city in the peninsula, but a small one with a population of uh, 180,000 people. You see volcanoes as soon as your plane approaches the airport. And uh, in my view in Kamchatka, uh, the contrast between the magnificent nature and uh, decrepit urban settlements is, uh, it can be very striking. Just some more pictures from sail to ski. You can see the sun coming up from the ocean. Some wildlife, seals. You can also spot orcas sometimes. That's the bay. Adjacent bay. Still frozen. Well, that's the lake apparently, sorry. <laughs> and uh, use of an inflatable boat uh, allows to uh, ski to a different place, uh, then be picked up and uh, brought back to the ship. There are some steep slopes. There is an active volcano in the background. The 
that's it about Kamchatka, and uh, we are coming to uh, the final and uh, probably the most exciting part of uh, uh, my talk uh, about ski expeditions and opportunities for ski expeditions available in Russia. I could have made uh, another lecture on this subject because there are so many destinations available. Uh, the country is huge. And there is a rich legacy, which means uh, there are many trip reports uh, done by Soviet groups and by modern groups as well. It all started back in the USSR like this. I took these photos uh, some maybe 16 years ago. You can see that we are featuring homemade outfit. We used avalanche cords instead of electronic transceivers. You can see in, inside of our uh, tent, there is a hanging stove and it's uh, hanging off the ceiling because uh, if it was standing, it would melt through the snow. Uh, the stove is made of titanium, uh, homemade <laughs> apparently. Uh, the chimney is uh, folding. So plenty of uh, funny homemade gear. But now things have changed. Uh, people are mostly using ski tour gear. Old telemark bindings, which we had in early nineties and before that. Now, um, I'm gonna give you an example of a modern uh, ski expedition that uh, my friends did recently, uh, last year, uh, in the Kodar area in Eastern Siberia. It's uh, the area known for its harsh climate. It's not a typical ski destination, but more of expedition destination. The trip uh, took 20 days. The temperatures uh, they faced were down to minus 35. The food rations were 600 grams per day per person. And they uh, had to uh, surmount about 15 waterfalls, frozen waterfalls, mostly on the way up. The total distance was uh, 230 kilometers. And uh, amazingly, the team consisted of mostly girls. There were five girls and three guys. And this expedition, as a result, uh, it won third place in the championship of Russian. And yes, we do have uh, championships of expeditions. <laughs> Some photos from that trip. Perhaps it was more walking on the ice than skiing, more climbing <laughs> than skiing. You can see many participants, they had to carry uh, two track mats because it was quite cold and they used sleds. Right. Whew, that was a long journey. Thanks for staying. Um, still, we haven't covered many areas, uh, many less mainstream destinations like uh, Kolyma, Polar, Ural, Altai, Priyuskovi, Kurile Islands, you name it. Uh, to learn more about uh, skiing in Russia, I definitely recommend you watching the uh, Ride the Planet series and uh, Kathy will uh, 
send you a link in the chat. Uh, those series are available on YouTube and provide quite a good uh, coverage. Mostly Heliski though, but uh, still they, uh, the guys, they managed uh, to convey the spirit of uh, every location quite well. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can ask them now, or if you come with questions later, don't hesitate uh, to get in touch. Here's my email address and uh, my company is called Primalscapes. We organize uh, all sorts of uh, trips, including uh, skiing, including sail to skiing from Chatka and uh, skiing in Elbrus area and in Siberia, of course. Oh, questions. Um, if you're still with us, do you want to just unmute your mic and uh, ask Andre directly? Yes, it's just um, for somebody who's not been to Russia before, uh, what would be a good first choice for a location for day trip touring? Uh, so you're, you're talking mostly about uh, ski tour rather yes. than uh, yes. side country, correct? Yes. Uh, it depends on your uh, skiing ability and it depends on the season. Uh, but uh, if you are not into big lines of Elbrus, then probably Arhiz would be a good choice. Uh, it is... Uh, looks more like uh, you got used to in Europe. Uh, the climate is good, but again, it depends on the season. You know, if you want to open your season earlier, then your better choice would probably be Siberia because you can do plenty of day trips uh, in Siberia as well. Whereas in Arhus, uh, it's mostly about spring touring. So, it starts in uh, March and lasts until uh, end of April. Uh, quite late, late season, really. Yes. Oh, and uh, uh, again, in Elbrus, uh, you can ski up until uh, mid June if you are into glacier skiing. And um, Andre, when you said you were talking about Mamey, uh, and having to book the cabins a year in advance. Mm -hmm. um, who, are the, who are the skiers that are coming into Mamey uh, that are filling it up? <laughs> there are plenty of uh, commercial operators who run the trips there. Uh, so it's literally packed with guides and their clients. But, you know, uh, all those people, they book in advance. Uh, well, Susan wants to know when you're offering your next Eagles trip, she'd be interested in 2022 or 2023. I'm sure she won't be on her own. Well, I'd be happy to, you know, <laughs> hopefully they will open borders soon. There are some technical issues, uh, by the way, uh, preventing me from organizing an Eagle trip. Uh, just uh, because the club apparently has changed uh, the insurance provider and now you cannot uh, organize a trip if you are not uh, a citizen of the UK. But hopefully we will be able to <laughs> overcome this somehow. Uh, yes, I have the same problem. I can no longer lead trips because I'm not British and I don't live in the UK. Um, it does look like the thing to do is potentially to have one of the British people be a, um, a liaison, basically. So someone keen like Susan or Tim uh, becomes the sort of the British de facto organizer. And then we bring in one of the foreign members who's the kind of the local expert um, and try and put that together like that. For, for people who are surprised, it's to do with the insurance, yeah. um, the liability insurance through Mountaineering Scotland. Um. Any more questions, please? The coffee has just kicked in, you know, I cannot sleep anymore. 
<laughs> no, you mean we're going to leave you right awake for the rest of the night while we all go to bed. <laughs> so, um, uh, Kam, Kamchatka, uh, the, the sailing, uh, what boats are you using? How are you organizing that? Uh, in fact, uh, I've decided to organize a trip uh, for a group of uh, Russian skiers this season because uh, the borders are still closed and I cannot bring in foreigners. Uh, and uh, I'm going there uh, in early May, uh, so in about a month or so. And uh, I chartered uh, a small boat, uh, a small motorboat. Uh, you can look up on my website, uh, there is a photo of that boat. Uh, it takes up to seven people. Uh, guides, uh, they sleep outside in tents, which arguably is probably not too, not too bad if you are prone to seasickness, but it's definitely colder outside. Uh, yeah, so a small motorboat. It's reasonably comfortable. Uh, it has shower, toilets, and cabins. Um, I noticed in the photographs lots of blue sky and sunshine. Uh, how realistic is that? And how much is that just taking photographs when the weather is good? Uh, in uh, Kamchatka, mm, you got to try it. You know, the weather can be tricky, uh, but. Uh, in May, the weather is generally good because uh, the fierce uh, snowstorms of uh, February and March, they're long gone and, uh, you know, the weather is more stable. But uh, obviously we do have uh, reserved lands in case uh, the weather deteriorates. Uh, so we just uh, use uh, the money uh, to organize uh, Head skin or snowmobile supported skin somewhere else. And the destinations you show that were the big powder destinations for early in the winter. I mean, how much of that time are you actually skiing with incredibly flat light and and poor visibility? Could you say that again, please? The the destinations uh, for powder mm -hmm. for early in the winter. Yep. Um, I'm interested in the weather, how often you have flat light and bad visibility. Oh, uh, quite often, really. We don't have that, that many bluebird days uh, uh, in the classical sense, you know, because uh, unfortunately due to uh, climate change, uh, quite often all that uh, snow dumps uh, they come with a strong wind uh, and uh, not that it uh, makes uh, the snow dense, no, but uh, sometimes, uh, well, not sometimes, quite often on a powder day, you feel you see your skin inside a tennis ball. <laughs> Still, you can uh, go on ski tour next day and there will be plenty of snow left and not on not only on the next day, but as I've mentioned, the snow uh, stays, uh, it does not uh, degrade for, for days. So you can ski tour for quite a while after snowfall. And with all these places where there's little or nothing in the way of avalanche forecasting, mm -hmm. are, there, are there many avalanche accidents for skiers? Uh, certainly there are some, yes, uh, but uh, again, uh, all those spots uh, are well known by the locals uh, and uh, also uh, the guides, they have to carefully evaluate uh, avalanche conditions, obviously, uh, but also uh, in some places like Mamai, thanks to the nature of the snowpack and lack of wind, uh, the avalanche conditions are not so tricky. In Siberia, generally, uh, avalanche conditions are rather um, benign, uh, unlike uh, Elbrus 
area, for example. And again, in Elbrus, it is uh, much more gentle than we have in Kyrgyzstan, where I uh, undergo my guide tuition. Because in Kyrgyzstan, the climate is uh, harshly continental. And uh, in the beginning of the season, you can have a snowpack uh, like half a meter. And uh, it can be very cold still. So you would get like 10 weak layers. <laughs> So would you recommend generally uh, skiing with a local guard? Generally, yes. Uh, unless it is uh, a side country scheme of, of lifts. And uh, again, uh, without a guide or an organizer like myself, it uh, may be difficult uh, to get the logistics done without uh, knowledge of Russian. Right, a couple of final questions, and then I think we should wrap it up. Um, Susan was asking, what's the ratio of guide to clients? In my view, uh, on my trips, uh, we never exceed one to five. Uh, and then Tim was asking, uh, to get to uh, Kamchatka, do you have to fly through Moscow or can you fly via Anchorage? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, there used to be flights, uh, even some regular flights from Anchorage, uh, but to my knowledge, they only operated uh, in summer uh, and they mostly served uh, the needs of uh, probably hunters, and so on. So uh, the choice is quite limited. Uh, you don't have to fly to Moscow, actually. Uh, you can fly to uh, Vladivostok. Uh, that's another city in the Russian Far mm -hmm. East. And from there, you take a merely three hours flight to Kamchatka from the Vladivostok. And there are many flight connections to Vladivostok. You, you can fly there from... Uh, Sydney from Singapore and so on. So if you are based in Australia, for example, you can reach Kamchatka without having to go to Moscow. But if, if you are based uh, in Alaska and you want to go to Kamchatka in winter, then you have to cross the, the whole globe. Uh, 